Welcome in. It's the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. He is Sean Fitz, and this is our last episode before Penn State kicks off in Kinnick Stadium against Iowa. Big matchup Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern time kickoff, 3 p.m. local. I think we've done a pretty good job taking a step-by-step approach this week, Sean. We started things off with David Eicholt, who covers Iowa for 24-7 sports. Long conversation, breaking down the Hawkeyes on Monday, shifted it back here to Penn State on Wednesday during our recording session and really focused in on where things stand from a personnel perspective, who's going to contribute from that freshman class. Not really anybody except Galen King. And then ultimately where we land with the running back rotation and some of the storylines. So now we resurface on Thursday, just about 24 hours later, Sean, one day closer to kickoff and we got predictions coming. We got some keys to the game. Uh, It's been quite a week here. Yeah, we went. Uh, I think we went one and zero on Monday with the uh, David Eicholt interview. It was great. Uh, yesterday, a little bit closer, but one and zero there. And hopefully, we do the same today. And hopefully, that results in a one and zero on Saturday. So you just take it one, one, one game at a time, one podcast at a time. We appreciate you joining us, whether you're joining us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on our YouTube channel at Lions Twenty Four Seven, which we do encourage you to subscribe. Helps us out a little bit, gets a little, a little bit more visibility out there, and and that's a good thing for everybody. So thank you for those who have followed along. Again, you don't have to look at our faces but a subscription would be appreciated so click that uh click that subscribe button on youtube and i do want to note before we get rolling along too much uh the guy who, who drives the youtube bus for us at 24 7 sports josh pate um he did post about a 10 minute long perspective and prediction video uh, about this matchup penn state and iowa he's not popping on the podcast i know everyone's like waiting for the next time josh shows up here not right now but it's up on our site uh josh spent about 10 minutes breaking this thing down gave his prediction I think Penn State fans will really like a lot of what he had to say. Um, Back here in Happy Valley, Sean, we had a chance to get back on the practice field Wednesday, as we normally do. Uh, Got a chance to wrap up some some media availability after practice with James Franklin and safety Jair Brown. And then Thursday with Mike Yersich. I want to get into that Yersich conversation in a moment before we get to the Iowa Penn State keys to the game and, and, and everything there. Um, but, you know, Noah Kane looks like he's ready to roll. He was described uh, as full go by James Franklin. So I, I know there's been some questions about where he is from a health standpoint and how the staff views that. Nothing that we have seen would lead you to believe that that situation might change. But you do wonder when this offense heads out on the field, will it be a sixth consecutive Saturday in which Kane is the running back with that first unit? I think so. And and to be honest with you, the starter doesn't matter as much at that position, but it's who's going to get the load of the carries. And if he keeps playing the way that he's been playing and um, I, I hesitate to call it uh, tentative or or whatever, he just does not look comfortable out there carrying the football. And, and it's interesting because there were times this year, you think back to, to week one against Wisconsin, he made those plays in the open field, especially in the passing game. He was very big. Um, but, you know, as a, as a running back, as, as the guy taking the handoff straight from Sean Clifford, just hasn't been all there. Now, maybe he'll get comfortable. Maybe he loved Kinnick Stadium the last time he was there. Uh, so maybe he'll be comfortable and, and break out of that funk and, and, and everybody will just let this one go. Um, but that he's going to have to prove it. And that's uh, that's one thing when you're looking at Kevon Lee behind him, John Lovett, who I think is going to get some touches on Saturday um, as well, and Devin Ford, who's probably playing as well as he has in a long time. You've got plenty of questions with that group, and and whether Kane is full go or not really shouldn't matter. It's can he can he be an effective back because you know if he's not health or if he if he is healthy and this is the product that he's getting out is getting out there, you're going to have questions. Over to the defensive backfield, there aren't any questions right now about this safety pairing that Penn State has. The same starters through the first five games and guys who used to play together back in 2018 at Lackawanna College at the junior college level. Now here they are helping lead this Penn State defense into a matchup at Iowa. Jaquan Brisker, Jair Brown. Brisker was a two-deep guy at safety, contributor on special teams, came up with a big play interception uh, at Iowa a couple years ago. Um, He's back there, but Jair Brown, you know, He's really starting to appreciate and and soak in where he is in his career. It was cool to talk to him after practice. And James Franklin said, we've got two of the best safeties in college football. So it's not just Jaquan Brisker. And James Franklin left us with that note. It was kind of his mic drop comment before he was done with his media availability for the week. So something to chew on a little bit about how this staff sees how things are going with Jaya Brown, who they call TIG, around team facilities. 
Yeah, Tig is an easy one to root for. I think everybody in that building pulling for him a little bit older um, than you would think because he took I think he took that year off after high school. He's from Trenton. The thing I remember always remember about him is one time I wanted to interview him. I think it was right after he committed. He couldn't do it because he was working a factory job at that point. You don't see too many of these recruits that come through that do that. Um, so for him to make that uh, transition from where he was to Lackawanna to Penn State and have success with it, three picks on the season tops on the team, that's pretty awesome. So um, it, it's cool, to, cool to watch. And and we were talking about this in my chat on lines twenty four seven earlier today. You know, it's one of those situations where Penn State's not going to want to use the COVID year as uh, as a way to extend eligibility or anything like that. But I think Jair Brown fits the bill of a guy that they would be willing to to give that extra year to. He's just been here for two years. Didn't didn't redshirt. Um, so he's got an opportunity to sort of stretch that one out. The only college landing spot for him until the very last moment that Lackawanna could take a player on their roster back in 2018 was a Division Three opportunity at Montclair State in New Jersey, now considered by James Franklin one of the top safeties in college football. It hasn't been that long of a span, and you're right, a guy that's easy to root for, Sean. Um, what Someone else that, that Franklin has talked a lot about this year in the defensive backfield, uh, and, and it, it was certainly startling earlier uh, in the spring to hear about Kaylin King, and Franklin put, putting him up against any freshman that he's seen in his experience here at Penn State in terms of a guy who came in ready to compete and play. He's played all five games. He's burned that red shirt. Defensively, he peaked with 40 snaps in that vicinity against Ball State. He had three tackles. He had a forced fumble. Found it interesting, though. I asked about James Franklin. I thought maybe he'd, he'd take it and run with it and talk about how great Kalen King continues to be. He said some of those things, but he stopped short and said, okay, now it's time for Kalen to take that next step. It's going to be about consistency. And he went so far as to say, hey, there's a special teams unit that he's not working on right now that he should be working on. So there are there are certainly signals out there that the staff wants to keep Kalen King motivated, who last week at least um, was the fourth guy used uh, in terms of snaps. John Dixon was the third man in a cornerback. I'm, I'm not counting Daquan Hardy, who has that nickel role to his own right now. Yeah, um, Kalen King has kind of. I don't want to say gone by the wayside, but uh, as they've moved into the the tougher part of the schedule, um, the passing part of the schedule with the Indiana offense coming in, you know, just uh, didn't see the field as much. I thought it was interesting. He compared him a little bit to Grant Haley as, as Grant Haley started his career playing on defense and on special teams, but he said he got his confidence on special teams. That one was interesting to me. So it, it wasn't, it, you know, I think it, it looked worse. Um, on just uh, on pen and paper in yes. terms of the the calling out of Kalen King because um, he was trying to tell a story and get a story across there. Um, but it's notable, and and you'd like to see that that continued motivation from Kalen King. And and he, he's treating him like a veteran. That that's the good thing here is is he treating him like a guy that's been around and played a bunch of football. And and that's uh, certainly a solid sign. Is you're obviously going to lose three Castro Fields after this year, and, and maybe even Joey Porter. So um, you're going to need him to grow up at some point. Don't quite need him there yet but you're going to need him to grow up at some point it seems like they have a lot of trust in the true freshman from detroit the first freshman to burn his red shirt we talked about this early in the early in the week it may be a while until we see another red shirt and it's not going to be a long list of those burned red shirts here in 2021 but certainly kaylin king has been a green light for a long time um hey we got mike yersich today and that's always a good thing when when, when you do what we do in this industry because he is an outstanding Q and A session. Um, if you enjoy the the mad scientist aspect of of what he is as an offensive mind, you love it. If you want to get into a deeper dive on that quarterback room, today was a great day too. i uh, were able to do all those things, Sean, and and it was a call that I don't know about twenty minutes packed a lot into it. Um, I think it was pretty clear uh, that that he is probably tired of fielding the how Sean Clifford questions because there's a lot more involved in the offense with Sean Clifford, and he probably feels like Sean Clifford has earned a little bit of distance from those kind of questions. But uh, I'll tell you what, he, he did make a statement, and, and we'll play the audio in a moment, just talking about how Clifford made a decision this offseason, going into this season in September, that he was going to be, in his words, uh, one tough SOB in, in the pocket, stand there, keep his eyes downfield, know that physical contact was coming from a defender, and still deliver the ball, move to his – you know, we talked about this before, Franklin – get get lateral extend plays but but do it within a controlled way and this was all kind of on the plate and and a lot from your on on clifford this this morning 
Yeah. First off, I don't think he's, I think he's getting tired of all the questions. I, if you gave him the chance uh, to not talk to media ever, I think Mike Gersuch would take you up on that in a heartbeat. So he I had some good. I don't know if we have a lot of assistant coaches to speak with over the course of the season, if that was a solid, oh, solid the point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Solid point. I think he probably leads the way in that, in that category though. Um, but uh, no, it's a, uh, it, it's a kind of a tribute to Sean Clifford because there was so many questions. I mean, when he got here, that's all it was, was questions about how do you, uh, essentially fix Sean Clifford instead of, uh, you know, what are you going to take and, and run with from what he provided earlier is, is what are you going to do to make this guy not the 2020 version of himself? We've done a pretty good job so far. Um, so I, I think he's probably just kind of worried about, well, first off, he's worried about calling plays in the next game. He's not worried about what he's saying to the media, um, but he's worried about, uh, you know, getting that next step and, and taking that uh, that next direction for the offense. And, and Clifford's going to be a big part of that. So the, the questions won't go away. Um, but the fact that we are asking him those questions now in a much different tone than we were six months ago says something about the job that he's done. Yeah. And, and this comment from your subject that we're going to play now for our listeners was regarding not just Clifford's pocket presence, but also his playmaking ability and and allowing him to have some flexibility, maybe outside the framework on offense when things go awry and what that might look like for this offense. Uh, here are the full comments from your subject. I think you'll get a good impression of, of how he has kind of uh, grown to feel for Sean Clifford through five games. His ability to absorb the information. He, he takes the game plan and he really studies it hard. He does a great job preparing. That's something that you, you don't know about any individual until you actually get to work with him on a real game to game basis. And he's been very consistent. His mentality has been very even keel and poised. I mean, he's a fiery person by nature, but he's able to stay calm and adjust. And, you know, with as much experience as Sean has, I think the biggest attribute that he has is that is the poise that he has. He, he can he can regroup if things aren't going great and get back into rhythm. And so that's something that I think is unique about him. And it is a really good quality that any quarterback should have. All right. So you heard it there. I think that's a mutual respect that has continued to grow. These are two guys that challenge each other. Uh, we heard Yersic say it's not a one way street when these guys are talking about football, the conversations leading up to games. He wants Clifford's input. Clifford is a guy who's played at Kinnick Stadium. He's played 25 plus games at this level now as a starting quarterback so it's been interesting you know we haven't had that big flare-up remember we talked about that in the preseason uh, you know with these two guys butt heads on the sideline with your not in the booth that hasn't happened yet um it, it still may and it might happen when they're winning the game but it's really fun to hear these guys talk about their relationship and i can only imagine behind closed doors how those guys bounce thoughts off of each other and it would be a wild thing to observe for a week well you look at what sean clifford um it, you got him the, earlier this week and he was I'd say uh, he was he was short on answers and things like that. He seems to be locked in and ready yeah. to go for this week. Um, and I, I feel like Yursich is probably the same type of mentality. It's just like put all this other bullshit to the side and focus on Iowa. And, and you're getting that from Clifford. You're getting that from Yursich. I mean, Clifford has said some things in the past. Um, audio clippable type things where you're, you know, the most confident quarterback and all that kind of stuff. And it's, and it's a little bit, it's a little fluffy, but it seemed like this week he's, he's a little bit more drawn in and, and figuring out what he needs to do. And um, he's been in this situation before it's, it's obviously um, not the most comfortable going against an Iowa defense. that's really good, but he's been in this situation before. And if he can handle it, um, you know, pre-snap and, and all those things that he struggled with uh, last year and the year before, if he can handle all that, find himself in a pretty good spot. So, but luckily he's also got some guys on the outside that, that help him out quite a bit. John Dotson, you know, we talked about Kirk Ferenc, his comments on Dotson this week, Mike Yurse, it's also a few nice things to say about number five. Yeah. And, and he's, he called him a complete receiver. Um, it wasn't going to go down the road and making any comparisons. And he's a guy who's had some pretty impressive playmakers in his offenses over the years. But he says that the magic exists with Dotson at the point of contact, this physical element that they feel he's now bringing more than ever before. Yursich didn't see him, didn't coach him last year, but Franklin actually noted this on Tuesday that a big step forward for Dotson that he's not sure people are taking enough note of is the physicality and the way with which he is attacking defensive backs and, and, and that back end of the defense. It's not just that breakaway speed in the 4-3-3, which helps your cause, uh, but I think that's very interesting to hear that noted by the offensive coordinator and the head coach the same week. Uh, the quote here from Mike Yersich, he finishes his catches with tough runs, lowers his pads, and brings a physical element and a finish. Sounds exactly like ex what people want at running back right now for Penn State, doesn't it, Sean? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's never been the scouting report on Dotson. Dotson was always the guy that could get in and out of breaks. He could slide through uh, little gaps and, and make some catches and, and make some artistic. Uh, it was more of an artistic player uh, than a tough player, but he's made some tough ass catches, man. It's, it's been really crazy to watch his, uh, you know, his ball skills just kind of pop off the screen. Um, it's been fun to watch. I'm not going to lie, um, but he's just become a complete receiver. He's become probably the best receiver in the Big Ten, right up there with David Bell and and, and Garrett Wilson and Olave at Ohio State. I mean, there's there's a bunch of good receivers in the Big Ten, um, and uh, and and Jahan Dotson's got the argument for for being the top one right now. I think he leads the league with six touchdown catches so far. Um, they'll need that this weekend, and and you look at what the the matchup provides for for Penn State and Iowa, and a lot of that. Um, a lot of the focus on the Iowa defense is on the takeaways, but you know, this, this Penn state offense has skill players that can take the top off and, and get loose. And, and that could be the difference. It could be, you know, just one or two of those big plays, but as we saw against Wisconsin, sometimes that might be all it takes. That's where I look at, at a potential, you know, something that could tip the scales on a play or two in this matchup, Sean, is I think the short to intermediate passing game on both sides of the football are going to be so important. I think both quarterbacks are going to need to be very precise. They're going to need to get the ball out of the pocket quickly. Both of them have good tight ends to use. Both of them have receiver uh, running backs who get the ball out of the backfield. But when I look at the outside edge, I certainly think, and I and, and Hawkeye's defensive backs, they deserve every credit in the world for what they've done so far in the season. But this will be a major opportunity for, for John Dotson, Parker Washington, and Keandre Lambert-Smith to go out and show what they can do against a defense of that caliber. And certainly Clifford as the trigger man, um, you do take some risks in taking those shots. But that to me is if you're looking at offense versus offense, I think they can both accomplish a lot, 10, 15 yards down the field. But when you cap it off at that, who's going to convert on those deep shots? I like Penn State's chances a lot more in this matchup than I like Iowa's opportunities. Yeah, I agree with you there. And and like you said, I was takeaway numbers are stupid. I mean, just incredible uh, so far. You know, some of that luck, some of that uh, or a lot of that is being coached up and being in the right spot. And, uh, you know, you can't I, I was talking to a buddy um, the other day and he's talking about, you know, you just kind of throw out t- turnovers because it's mostly luck. Iowa creates their luck, puts themselves in the position to to make those turnovers or to to force those turnovers, and does a great job with it. So you can't discount all that stuff as just uh, Maryland throwing them the ball seven times or something like that. You're going to find yourself in the right spot. Um, what's interesting to me, we talk about Dotson, um, but the middle of the field can be very important, especially against this zone. Um, you can find Brenton Strange, Theo Johnson there, and Parker Washington. I think is going to be very, very important. Uh, David Eichholt was on the other day talking about those drag routes and, and things like that across the middle. That's going to be very important because if, if Penn State decides that that's a direction that they want to go in and, and not all coaches want to throw over the middle of the field, especially on the road um, in a big atmosphere. But if they if they can do that, uh, they can have success and, and, and certainly open it up a little bit. Yursich said today they understand that defensive game plans on a week to week basis are going to try to eliminate Jahan Dotson for stretches of the game, and they're starting to feel more confident that they can distribute the ball. They feel they have distributed the ball in a way that forces defenses uh, to counter that, and ultimately you're freeing up Jahan Dotson by the end of it, or you end up getting 150 passing yards to to Parker Washington by the end of the day. So, look, uh, they've done a nice job with that so far. It's not like we're entering this matchup like a couple years ago when it felt like it was K.J. Hamler or or no one at wide receiver. And you had to count on him and Pat Fryermuth for everything in the passing game. This is a different you know, look right now. And Jahan Dotson is the guy. Um, but let's face it. If you want to make these deep shots converted, if you want to be able to get the passing game in a rhythm, there's got to be some stability from the ground game. And, and that's a tall task in this matchup. I think you look to the interior for Penn State versus this defensive front for the Hawkeyes and what they can bring from the second level and the discipline they play with. There's not going to be a lot of daylight. Um, and and what can this running back group do to convert? And I thought it was interesting. Mike Yersich said uh, the receivers and tight ends have played well. The running backs, he said, still coming along. He said, though, they're definitely good enough. There's no question about it. But he said the rhythm is lacking right now. And so they can't get to an elite level, he says, until that is found. And it's not about pinpointing one thing, he says. It's a combination and being able to do it for 60 minutes. It has not taken shape for them. He, in some ways, echoed James Franklin and saying, hey, if it's three guys who are playing at a high level, we'll roll with them. But he certainly sounded like he leaned more toward wanting a true number one guy, someone who takes that step 
they're still looking forward. It was a topic that we discussed for several minutes last week or last episode. So we won't have to do it here, but let's face it. I think we'll have a good indication early of what, what, of what Penn state wants to accomplish and who they want to accomplish it with on the ground. And then I'm curious if it doesn't work, how do they adjust coming out of halftime or even going into the second quarter? Because you can't, stay stagnant on the ground in this game. Yeah, you you got to be able to run something. Uh, just keep them honest. And and if you have to go to the short passing game to be a part of your run game, then you can do that. Um, I think that's a really interesting way to describe it uh, from your switch that the, the rhythm was just a little bit off. It's kind of like a golf swing. You know, you can you can hit the, the heck out of the ball straight, um, you know, once out of five times. But the other five, if you're if your rhythm's off, if you're, you know, your back swings off or something like that, then you're, you're not going to end up where you want to be. And it, it kind of feels like the running game right now. They've been able to get a chunk here and a chunk there. It's just hasn't been able to come through and and be productive, uh, you know, on a consistent basis. Where I'm looking right now, I think Iowa's got the uh, the advantage, especially in the interior of the defensive line. Iowa's defensive line, always good. No matter that, you just circle the names and put a van in front of it. And that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of how Iowa rolls, and they do a great job with it. Um, so Eric Wilson, Mike Miranda, Drew Scruggs uh, are definitely on notice this week. It's going to be a really tough week for those guys. And I, I'm going to say, you know, count those tight ends. Uh, not necessarily talking interior there, but we have seen them go in motion or, or line up in that backfield and be involved and being counted on to provide some physicality. That's been the key word this week. Let's not lie and say this is the first time midway through the season going into a key stretch of Big Ten play that James Franklin has asked for more edge or for more nastiness or for more physicality from his offensive line. I know for a lot of people it feels like an annual event. And, and here you go. Uh, here's your platform to make that step. And if you don't and you're exploited, um, it, it's going to happen um, against a, a team that feels like they're ready to exploit you in a big way. Mm -hmm. It's going to be uh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be grinded out. And, I, you know, I, I mentioned those three interior guys, but the tackles too. Uh, Caden Wallace has been very hot and cold this year, more, you know, more cold than they would like. Um, at times, uh, Rashid Walker has been very good, um, but that's a that's a whole unit across front the front. I think this is one of those situations uh, why they were playing so deep into games. You wanted them not only to get reps with the back of quarterback, but get those guys together as much as possible in a game situation, and then you can maybe um, you know uh, cultivate what you need to what you need to find by the time Iowa comes through Ohio State, uh, Michigan, obviously those big time defensive fronts that the, these schools have. So. I think it's very, very important for that group to to get off on a good start, whether that's uh, you know a big run a big run right away, or you know something short in the passing game where they get out ahead and just feel get on the front foot. Really, um, it's gonna it's gonna be important. But yeah, that's a that's a advantage Iowa. If I'm going into the game and marking this up, that that Iowa defensive line against this Penn State interior. My biggest concern for Penn State, and we'll talk about our predictions in a few minutes here, is uh, regardless of who is ahead, I see this being a one-score game going into the second half of the fourth quarter. And if Penn State is the team that is ahead, can they pull off a 2019 Noah Kane situation? It doesn't necessarily have to be Noah Kane this time around. It could be Kevon Lee. It could be John Lovett. But it could be Devin Ford. Can it you doesn't have, matter who it is. They no. haven't done it yet. So can that's the do thing. It? Yeah, yeah, they haven't done it. And and that was a big question for that 2019 Penn State team, too. And that was a big step. Remember, we were starting to call Noah Kane the closer, and then he got hurt. And and if you can find that closer magic again for Noah Kane, or if you can sprinkle it on Kevon Lee and get that going, they've called him a closer type back before. We saw that a little bit last year. I just I, I, that's a major concern for me because it's one thing to, to it's going to be really hard for Penn State to go into the final few minutes of this game with a lead like that is going to be an accomplishment enough. But to close the door, they're going to have to do something that they have not proven they can do yet here in 2021. And they're going to have to do it on the road and, and to put this one away. And the benefit of the doubt is not there for them right now. Uh, I don't know if Iowa has the offense to make them pay for it on the back end if they got to give the ball up. But it's a concern. Yeah, it's absolutely a concern. It's a big challenge for that offensive line this week. Um, one other thing on offense before we turn our attention to, to just a couple notes on defense here and, and our predictions, um, a lot of, of praise, I would say, um, not necessarily effusive or, or saying he's starter ready, but a lot of strong words for Taquan Roberson as the backup quarterback right now for Penn State. Mike Yersich was very cautious, very careful all offseason. Every time we had a chance to talk to him, Sean, about saying anything really about Taquan Roberson, about giving any kind of evaluation, even coming out of spring practice, it was just kind of like, He's got to keep working. Uh, you know, he's got to keep working. He's got to get reps. Right now, uh, he's talking about the ball popping off his hand, um, feeling like, again, we've talked about this before, but 
pre-snap, what, what, what are you doing? Are you, can you identify when you're in a bad run situation? Are you, are you savvy enough at this point within this offensive structure to change things up at the play, prevent a, a nightmare from developing in the backfield for yourself? That's a question right now that they have. And, and look, he's not going to play in a game. Your hope is the rest of the way here unless you need him in a mop-up duty. But I just thought it was interesting. I'd encourage people to go over. It took a while <laughs> transcribing this uh, this entire interview with uh, with – uh, with my, sorry, I got distracted by your dog there for a second. With Mike Yersich earlier today, um, transcribed it and uh, it's up on lines247.com. So they have a chance to, to to read through everything he said on Roberson, everything he said on Clifford. Had a little bit to say on Christian Bayer too, the, the number three quarterback, the true freshman, and um, a lot more there on on offensive uh, ingenuity and, and everything. So check that out. I don't want to rehash all of it, but I thought it was worth noting. Take one Roberson, a guy that we haven't discussed at really any capacity since preseason when I talked about him too much. It's seemingly impressing uh, the the man who's going to make some really interesting decisions next year regarding that quarterback spot. Yeah, it's it's all going to be coming down to him. Obviously, you got the two freshmen coming in early. By the way, UPS truck, not good timing <laughs> there. Um, we got the through two, it. The, the two freshmen are going to be coming in in January. Uh, Christian Veyer is still there as well. So there's a lot to talk about in that quarterback room for next year. But you mentioned last night coming off the practice field, you thought that that Roberson looked as as lively as you've seen him yeah. throughout the uh, throughout the season. Yeah, it's good to see a live arm. I mean, even if you're not playing games, you're at the point in the season where you've thrown a lot of passes since early August. You're putting in a lot of extra time when it's not a mandated practice session. So it's good to see. I thought I thought the ball was jumping off and uh, I thought the, the the placement against air, no defenders involved here, was good in the short period we saw. And, and it's certainly good to hear. It's promising to hear uh, for Taquan Roberson that, that Mike Yersich kind of followed it up because he could easily have given us about, you know, eight, nine words and moved on if he wanted to. And he opened up a bit on take Juan Roberson. I think that revealed something about where Roberson is in, in year three of his Penn State career. Uh, Sean, uh, 17 and 13 is Penn State's record all time against Iowa. They had a heck of a run here, built a win streak, and then saw that obliterated last year when, when Iowa came to Beaver Stadium, dropped Penn State to 0-5. Neither of these teams have lost since they met in Beaver Stadium last year. We well documented those win streaks. The, the interesting thing here is Penn State searching for a fourth consecutive victory in Kinnick Stadium. Yeah, go back a decade and say that to a Penn State fan and they will laugh in your face um, <laughs> because that that had been a house of horrors for a long time. Uh, this matchup kind of flipped on its head um, and, and I don't really see a long streak like that happening right now. Um, as we, uh, you know, it was, it was so one-sided for Iowa and then it was so one-sided for Penn state. Franklin, even, even in his, his down years, you know, Franklin was, uh, had success against Iowa, which was, was always an interesting, uh, juxtaposition for that, uh, for, for, for how he started his career at Penn state. Um, so this game, I mean, you, you have it written here, turnovers and field position. Is it really that simple? It's not, but that's close. You know, you get uh, you you protect the football if you're Penn State. You get a chance to uh, to get those big plays and 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 field position. James Franklin kind of, I don't want to say downplayed it, but he's he's been so they've been so successful punting the ball this year that you just feel like that's a that's an integral part of the way that they play football. And um, you know, Josh Pate was saying it on his uh, on his uh, show late kick. Uh, it was if you find yourself in a third a third and short you don't get it go fourth and one you're not afraid to punt it because that's this is the type of game where you know field position is going to matter i was field position i think second in the country in start average starting position if you can keep them from from getting the ball in your half and taking over you can stop that offense what happens if penn state's first possession reaches the iowa 43 yard line and you got a fourth and one and a half yard situation there what does it say about that aspect and what does it say about your confidence in the ground game on the decision you choose there i mean you're right this is the game where decisions like that could mean everything to you and, and we kind of went over how successful jordan stout has been no kick return to kick off returns allowed essentially wiping punt returners off the face of the earth and burying teams and when you combine that with the way this defense is played it's quite the combination and it goes totally counter to the way iowa has thrived this year where they're getting the ball at midfield uh, the, it is a quick journey to field goal range. It is a quick journey to the end zone, uh, relatively speaking. And here you got a rock and a hard place because Penn State, 24.8 yard line for opponents is the average. So, I mean, something's got to give in a pretty tremendous way. I don't see this one really just meeting in the middle. No, and and those special teams are going to be so important. Um, it, it, you just have to, uh, if you're Penn State, avoid letting Iowa play you into their game. And that's what they they do it so well. 
so um, better than anybody in the Big Ten, I would say that you know Ohio State's gone out there and gotten beat by because they fall into that trap. And if you're um, if you're Sean Clifford, you got to figure out a way to avoid that. And a way to do that is is by prolonging drives, extending, um, you know, getting first downs and and, and things of that nature. And you're not going to score on every drive. You're not going to probably come close to scoring on every drive. Um, but you have to make it so that your defense is is still fresh in the second half. Penn State obviously did not do a great job of that against Wisconsin to open the season, but but it seems like they've come around in that aspect in the last couple of weeks. You know what has was a consistent uh, aspect in that Penn State uh, victory, winning streak over Iowa was poor quarterback play from the Hawkeyes. There were games there where if they got even average quarterback play, Iowa wins that matchup. Happened time and time again. Can you get Spencer Petras exposed a little bit here? I thought David did a good job of saying – we don't really know what it's like right now when the pressure comes and he's got to decide outside the pocket. I think we're getting a firm understanding of where Sean Clifford has come in that area. To me, Arnold Evicati, Jesse Lucetta. Jesse, can you finish can you can you finish in the pocket and, and get to your guy? Evicati, can you get a third consecutive game with a Big Ten sack, maybe add a second? Those two guys to me, they can determine a lot if they can go up against these offensive tackles that you know could be overmatched and out talented in this matchup. David said. Watch the perimeter of this offensive line. And to me, I feel like an ascending part of Penn State's defense is the perimeter of their defensive line. Yeah, you you think about what um Penn, or what Iowa traditionally does well, and you never have to worry about that offensive line. They're a work in progress, especially on the edges. So uh, Arnold Ebikade uh, has a big opportunity this weekend. Uh, I think even in uh, even on the interiors, uh, PJ Mustafer will have an yes. opportunity to try and fight that one out. Now Linderbaum is tremendous i mean probably the best center in the country um but you've got an opportunity to to, to make some plays and, and to get in the backfield and um petrus you just got to keep him in front of you and and keep him from you know finding that uh dallas clark like tight end that pops up for 10 catches for 77 yards and moves the chain five or six times so um it's it, it's been a struggle for penn state in the past i know i just dated myself with the dallas clark reference but it's uh it, it's always one of those things that pops up with iowa football and even franklin said earlier this week you pop in a tape from five years ago 10 years ago whatever it may be uh you get you get a similar style of football so it's going to be big on that defensive line i think penn state probably has a slight edge um we'll see how they play as a unit and how they keep those linebackers clean because those linebackers probably going to be the key unit in this game. Yeah, James Franklin, by the way, called Iowa center Tyler Lindenbaum probably as good as he's seen at that position at the college level. And I think if you're PJ Mustafer and you can create a stalemate there, I mean, you take a stalemate and the, you don't need that. You don't need to be able to punch him in the mouth every day. You just don't want every snap. You just don't want to get him punching you in the mouth. And then Iowa's got things going and they're getting five, six yards a clip on the ground. That's where you start to fall into dangerous territory. So to me, PJ Mustafer, if he can create a stalemate situation in the middle, that's big. I mean, that's that's what you need in this spot. And the guy I'm going to be focusing on for Penn State, I, I really think he has stage here and the opportunity because of how athletic he is. I, Jaquan Brisker, I just feel like this is a moment. We, we saw him, you know, one of his early moments at this level was in Kinnick Stadium. I, I have just a sense that the return trip and the way he will be able to really impact the way Iowa can attack the center of the field and maybe go on the perimeter, make some kind of momentum swinging, game saving kind of tackle. I just feel like Jaquan Brisker is going to make his presence known two or three key spots along the way. I agree with that. And I will kind of flip this one on its head and say Penn State's most important player on defense might be Ellis Brooks because he's going to be in the target in the crosshairs for that Iowa offensive scheme, um, whether that's running the uh, the tight end down the seam or or trying to 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 get cute and get Tyler Goodson, the really good running back out in the screen game, something like that. Ellis Brooks is going to have to uh, going to have to play one of his best games on Saturday. I believe uh, we, we mentioned that Wisconsin game when he was kind of all over the field. And looking back, he, he guessed right a lot. He's going to have to guess right a lot on Saturday, and he's going to have to, to, to trust his instincts to get, get guys in the right position. I think there's a ton of pressure. If we talk about key guys on both sides of the ball, obviously Sean Clifford's going to be the first guy that comes up on offense. I'm going to say Ellis Brooks on defense. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with you there. Um, if you can get a variation uh, that looks anything close to Wisconsin in terms of uh, the percentage of being right, yeah, that, that's going to be a huge boost for, for them in this matchup. And uh, Sean, I think additionally, as, as we look, I'm just if, making sure we didn't miss anything. That's right. Goodson. I want to get back to him real quick. He's the guy I think you got to watch for. He on third down, the backbreaker, like in this matchup to me, him as a receiver out of the backfield, 
he's the guy that Penn State can't get loose because can't let get loose because I feel like he's somebody who could turn that third and nine where you feel like you're applying some pressure on the quarterback. All of a sudden, Goodson's got the ball and he's gaining 14, 15 yards and you're in there in your territory. He is that kind of a dual threat out of the backfield. And I think he has the capability to, to bite them a few times here. You just can't let it happen too often. Yeah, I agree with that. I think he's going to get some yards. Um, I don't know that it's going to be all on the ground. Like you mentioned, he's a really good receiver, a guy that can get out into space and do some things. You just can't let him get behind you and and do that kind of damage or get past you and do that kind of damage. I think he's a really good player, um, kind of a typical Iowa back that we've seen in the last decade. And um, just uh, 400 and what, 430 yards rushing. Um, you know, he's, he's a good receiver out of the backfield. I think he blocks pretty uh, fairly well as well. 12 catches this year. So second on the team in receiving. Um, so Goodson's going to be a big part of that. Sam Laporta, um, is a tight end who I, I don't think he's, he scares you physically like a Theo Johnson or a Brenton strange, but guy that just gets open. I, I, the, the Auburn tight ends name is, is slipping my mind right now. Um, but he just kept finding himself open, whether that be, uh, down the seam or or along the sideline. He caught a bunch of passes against Penn State, but Laporta is a guy. He's got 22 catches for two, uh, 263 yards and two touchdowns. Um, he's going to be a guy that they go to often um, to, to move the sticks. And, and with this offense, which is very much a work in progress, that's what they're looking to do too is, is prolong their drives and, and keep their defense off the field. Yeah, play action, play action, play action, play action. That's about half the times I heard that phrase talking to players and coaches this week about Iowa's offense. They're going to try to attack you that way. Um, how successful can they be? How efficient can they be against Penn State? Uh, I think that's going to determine can they muster out some drives? Because, again, this is not a deep shot Iowa team. Uh, again, I think Spencer P Petrus will be tested in a big way in this matchup. And so will Sean Clifford, of course. Um, and, and I do think this is going to be a close one. By the way, the tight end, because uh, we had time to look here, John Schenker. Uh, was the tight end for Auburn who came up big in that game. I, I just feel like I had to tell you that for some reason. Sean, it's, per that. <laughs> yeah, it's, per it's, it's prediction time. Um, and we've talked a lot about this matchup all week long. Time has come, sir. I don't have your prediction. You weren't quite ready. You said you were still crunching the numbers, running the data, running the models before we got on the podcast. Have you and your team come up with some kind of prediction score for us? Well, I, I did it. I told myself I wasn't going to do it, but I talked myself into Penn State winning. I This is a game that <laughs> I had Penn State losing, but uh, you know, the more I looked at it, you look at what Penn State has, and they've got a, a you know good offense, a very good defense. Iowa's got a great defense, but I don't think they have much of an offense. I think Penn State's going to have the opportunity to hit the big plays and really make it happen, and, and, and that's something that you look at Iowa's offense, you say, where are the points going to come from? Um, I think Penn State's defense probably be – being undersold at this point, at least from the national narrative, uh, you look at uh, you, you, all the talk is about Iowa forcing turnovers and things like that. Penn State's defense can do that too. So uh, I'm very curious to see where that goes. I have Penn State winning 21-17. Um, I think that that's probably, you know, I think the over-under of this game is about 40 and a half, which is dangerously low for a college football game. But at the same time, it, it makes sense because of these these two great defenses. Yep. Um, get, get the pipto bismol ready, whatever you need to, to help with the heartburn because it's coming this weekend. I think it's, it's how these matchups have gone between these two teams and last year, notwithstanding. I, I think, Sean, 23-17 is where I landed, and I kind of talked myself into adding a couple more points. I was at 20-17 to 17, really until today. I, I, now I see 23-17. I think Clifford's success story continues. That's going to be a, a great part of the story here. But to me, to your point, defensive performance on Saturday is going to be the difference. They're going to come out and look like the better defense against an Iowa team and their defense right now, which is getting a lot of love for all, for every reason that they should. But I think Penn State's going to go out there and really enter that conversation about, okay, outside of the SEC, who's got the best defense? And I know people get pissed that I even had that made that statement, but that's what the conversation could be if Penn State comes out of this, gets a win, and plays well defensively. 23-17. And how's this? Penn State wins the turnover battle that we've talked about so much, and they're not able to put the game away late with the run game. Penn State comes up with a red zone stand on defense to preserve a six-point lead, and then we come back and talk about it on the podcast. You're bringing the heartburn, are you? I, the, the thing I feel bad about with mine is 21 to 17 seems like way too round of a number for for Penn State. I, what was this, 19 to 12 uh, two years yeah. ago? And, uh, you know, the, you you see these all these crazy numbers. So I feel a little bit disappointed in myself that it wasn't like 18 
11 or something like that from my, for my prediction. So I feel bad about that, but you know, I, I like Penn state's chances here. And, and I mentioned the Wisconsin game so many times, because I can see this being a similar type setup where you maybe start slow. You, you kind of feel out the game on both sides of the ball, get to get a few punts here back and forth that, but you know, I think Penn State can land the haymaker, and I'm not sure that Iowa can. And that's really what pushed me across the edge is guys like Jahan Dotson, guys like Parker Washington that can go downfield. And Sean Clifford, if he's if he's you know the the guy that showed up the first five weeks of the season, Penn State could be okay. I like the the analogy to the second half of the Wisconsin game, and Penn State started landing those haymakers. They can't come out and, and lay a dud offensively like they did in that first half in Madison and, and survive this one. I don't think that's even feasible. But to your point, yeah, I mean, and that that experience that they take away from game one on the road, that confidence, that that really can't be understated going into this matchup at Kinnick. Sean, I think that's going to do it for us. We're back with the podcast, uh, win or lose, to break down how Penn State fared in Iowa City. And then it's off to a bye week. Um, and we got a lot to talk about, man. We, we, one, one way or the other, it's going to be a heck of a conversation coming our way on Saturday. Hope everyone enjoys the game. Please enjoy our coverage leading up to the game. We got a lot more coming your way. Remember that Mike Yersich uh, commentary, everything he said on these quarterbacks and, and much more up on lines247.com, recruiting coverage as well. Sean, anything else to add here? No, I don't think so. I'm, I'm looking forward to the game. Uh, I'm, I'm sure all our listeners are looking forward to the heartburn and the uh, mm. the churning, but you know at least it's a, a four o'clock game, and you you know you can get to get to bed at a decent hour afterward, and and you don't have to wait up until four a.m. for the post game podcast to drop. So we're looking forward to that. I know we're really looking forward to that on this end. Yeah, <laughs> number four Penn State, number three Iowa, four p.m. Eastern time, Kinnick Stadium. Until then, I'm Tyler Donahue. He's Sean Fitz. Our producer is Lance Glenn. We'll talk to you soon on the Lions Twenty Four Seven podcast.